Uh, well, I guess Peg isn't going to be with us today, okay. so uh, we might as well get rolling. Uh, we'll open the meeting, and uh, I see JP, uh, someone who would like to be recognized, Joe. Um, given that we don't have a, uh, a full-time secretary uh, for the purpose of this meeting, I would be happy to function as the uh, recorder. You, you know, uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say yes. <laughs> that would be great. I think everybody else is ducking and saying, yay, thanks, Joe. Well, next week will be somebody else's turn, but... I've got it for this time. All right. Thank you so much for volunteering. I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, I don't see anyone in uh, the waiting room, so we, we will not have any public speak. But we do have our minutes from uh, October 27. I would entertain a motion to uh, accept or any discussion about those minutes. Make a motion to accept. I'll second. I have a motion and a second to accept the minutes. Jay, were you the second? Yes. yes okay. Jay was. Uh, All right. the senior tax work off minutes of October 27, 2020. Thank you very much. Uh, a roll call vote. Uh, if you'd please say your name and whether you vote aye or nay for the clerk. Jay. Yes. Or aye. <laughs> Brendan. Aye. Jen. Aye. Joe? Aye. J.P. Krasinski? Aye. The ayes have it, surprisingly. Hey, so we had several issues that we were hoping to, to accomplish. I think uh, none the least of which was uh, an opportunity to hear from perhaps Tom Scanlon. I'm, I'm, I'm yep. ducking a little bit and saying, oh, my gosh, is that true? <laughs> Because uh, if it is, that would be great. We had, I know there were lots of questions. Yes. And if anybody uh, remembers any additional questions that Jen or I forget, please feel free to jump in. Uh, or if you had any additional questions that you think uh, the external auditor might be able to help. All right. So if I can just kind of uh, give you a little summary of my conversation with him. And I had a note around here somewhere that had more notes on it. But anyway, um, in terms of, well, I'm going to start by saying when Tom and I started our conversation, he said, Jen, it's a pain. <laughs> and I said, well, Tom, we're going to, we're going to muddle past that. And, and we're going to, we're going to figure out a way to make it not a pain. Um, so I did ask about CPA funds, using CPA funds to fund it. And he said yeah. that he had never been asked that before. Yeah. He said he doesn't know of anyone doing it because it always comes from the overlay. Um, right. Now, so I guess that that would be something that we would have to follow up with. I mean, I would guess, you know, whoever the CPA turns to when they have questions or, you know, because technically it would have to be that a pot of money was taken of, you know, appropriated from the CPA and then put into the overlay, but specifically for this program. The thing is, is the overlay account is also used for um, any abatements or exemptions. Right. So, tax, tax abatements. Right. Or exemptions. Right. Exactly. So, I mean, you know, so I guess the, the, that was not a concrete answer by any means. It wasn't a no, but he doesn't know of anyone that's doing it. Any, so right. we, we don't know. think that perhaps anyone was doing it, uh, but uh, we'll see. And I know, I know, auditors tend to have be very precise with money comes from here and goes there yes. and comes out of this pocket and gets put it and we post it here, and yeah. that's the way the world works <laughs> until we we somebody says. Oh, you can do that? And then we have to, like, invent the wheel again. Brendan. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you said both the tax exemption and work off would come out of the overlay. So would that impact the senior exemption, like, depending on how many people got on the program? Because we have a bunch of folks who are part of the, the tax exemption. 
Right. So is there a certain amount that's just dedicated to both? Pro is it like one amount for both programs or? No, the, the amount that we designate for um, this program, for the senior tax work off would be a set amount and it would be just based on what our determination is of total number of hours that we want them to work at the minimum wage and this is their their um credit their tax you know credit so it's it's separate from the senior okay. um exemption okay thank you for clarifying that yep. Yep. so so essentially i think to answer your question brendan i i, I think at some point somebody who is preparing uh for the tax rate would have to say we're going to have x amount of dollars here x amount there and that's going to cover what we anticipate to be needing in the overlay account i, I think that's how that works jen is that yeah i you know what i'm gonna i i'm gonna read actually i brought up the email tom and i had spoken on the phone and then after we got off the phone, I emailed him and I said, oh, I forgot to ask you about the CPA. So this is his CP, the, the CPA response. And he, his response is, I never came across using CPA funds. Not sure what the CPA fund would be used for associated with the program. The overlay is what is being used to make up the lost property tax revenue. There's no expense that CPA funds would be appropriated for. So I'm going to say no on that. So I think that his hang up from an auditing standpoint is that it's not it's not and i'm sorry there isn't a pigeonhole to to say right, right here okay it, good it exactly out of here and it's goes not there. a an appropriate it's not an expense in the sense that all of our other expenses are expenses you know what i mean so you know we can we can continue to to, see if to, we can yeah, get more see, clarification see what on I that have, i have a little bit to report on that a little bit later uh, so, but I'll hold that until we hear the rest of Tom, because there yeah. was so much that, that, uh, we had to ask him. Right. So, and so the other thing that I asked him was the, um, the timing, the, cause we had talked about, you know, if they work the hours, um, what, when, you know, is the credit earned, do we have to provide a W2 when they work the hours or when we give them the credit and, he says, usually there's a time frame associated with when work has to be completed. It's earned when worked. So that's when they're earning, earning the money. Uh, if you work in, let's say, August, the credit would go on the 11-1 tax bill. There should be no crossover in periods. And... Yeah. So, and, and Lori, I had reached out to Lori and assessors and she said pretty much the same thing, which is we don't want to cross, um, calendar years. So fiscal, fiscal or right. Like we want to try to keep it as straightforward as we can in terms of both fiscal and calendar. Right. Um, so, and she actually, I have, what did I get from her? Uh, she says, uh, it might be, it might be hard to run it by fiscal year unless you were to give a credit at the end of a fiscal year. Southampton ran it calendar year with an October cutoff. Uh, the assessor's office would need the info before the billing file was sent to Carol, which is usually mid to late November and a week or two uh, should be enough time to process. So if Carol needs to get the information, like we'll say mid-November, takes assessors a week or two to process, you know, and we gotta build some buffers in there. I mean, I don't know, what 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 were we looking at for a time frame? Did we? I were, we weren't clear whether we were operating on a calendar year or on a fiscal year. Right. Uh, we were presuming that we could have the flexibility to start sometime in the next fiscal year. That's FY22, July, right. July 1st. 2021 and after mm -hmm. and i had laid out a very ambitious plan last uh, last meeting yep. that everybody i think cringed at and said <laughs> oh gosh we could never do that <laughs> quite appropriately quite appropriately oh. um but so if we were to yeah 
So it's almost to me. Can you, can you discuss more about the calendar year versus the fiscal year again? So that we, because I, I would expect that tonight we're going to be making some decision. Well, we're going to recommend right. a calendar year or fiscal year. Uh, what's the amount? So, so, so I'm I'm seeing the biggest obstacle as we have to include this amount in the budget in the fiscal budget for the city. Uh, meaning, like if we decide that we're going to give them thirty thousand, then we have to we have to include that in what we put into the overlay account right so that gets approved beginning of july that can't be spent until it's approved but then if we need to you know if we need to get this information in by we'll say october that's not going to give us enough time for them to work the hours doing, oh yeah we're never going to get anything no. up and off the ground and closed out by that point exactly to run, to run in a in a in a calendar year right my thought is appropriate the money fiscal July in July for fit, what's okay. We're in 21. We're in fiscal 21. So come the, this coming July, we appropriate the money for, for our fiscal 22 budget and yep. then start the program. Like similar to the timeline JP that you had put forth, you know, maybe a little less aggressive, whatever, you know, but it just kind of started right away with the application process and, you know, going through and picking, picking things out. And then like, I'm almost thinking, get that, get that rolling, have them complete their hours by June 30th of the, of that fiscal year for the credit to be given that November. Does that make sense? It, it makes sense. So uh, what I'm hearing you say is 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 get the program up and running as soon as you can get it up and running, as soon as the dates kind of mesh, the, in, the interview process, all of that, get the hours in probably sometime, I'm guessing it'll be sometime from December through mm -hmm. some period afterwards. Right. That it'd be then on uh, a fiscal year. Mm hmm but I'm not. I thought we were trying to shoot to get it wrapped up in the same fiscal year, based on what the assessor was telling you, saying don't carry it from one fiscal year to another or one calendar. Somehow that that seemed important to try to do. So I think the question we're going to have to ask the assessor is, if we had the program up and running and it were able to close out by by. Uh, by eight, let's say April 30th, would you have time? No, we wouldn't because the tax bills are gonna be out January 1st. So the tax bills for the third and fourth quarters are out January 1st. Mm -hmm. So here's my thought. So, wow. Yeah, it, it's definitely a- uh... But, but how, what Tom had no, uh, no idea how other communities were handling that. I'm a little, you know, he, he, his, his thought was that they, no, nobody seems to have an issue with crossing over the fiscal years, but here's, here's where I think it, here's why I think, because if we do it, like I just said, where the money's approved for fiscal 22, the the actual money going from the overlay account into the tax revenue account is a GL transaction. Okay. So I that think, can, I think that means general ledger. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, my my accountant brain. Um, so yes. So that's a general. That's ledger. about the extent of my accounting. <laughs> range, so. That's that's the general ledger. That is a general ledger transaction. So, so where so I'm that going can just that, happen instantly. It, right. Where I'm going with that is Val will make a, a, a you know, there'll be paperwork showing how many people we're going to have, what the dollar amount's going to be. That will be enough of supporting documentation for her to transfer that money into the overlay account. And then when the tax bills go out, that's when the, the credit pulls from the overlay account. But I don't believe, and I can verify this, I, I'm, I don't believe that it will matter that the actual credit that's going on the bill 
happens after the fact. Oh, so all right, I, I, I think I have a, just one quick clarification, Joe, before I, let me get this thought out. <laughs> The January 1st doesn't matter because the bills can go out and it doesn't matter what the bill is. The bill is the bill. Boom. It's the payment of the bill that we're crediting. And so that function would occur when the bill gets paid from the monies that were earned. So, for example, I think you correct me if I'm mistaken. The January bill goes out and is due February 1st, is that something like that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the January bill goes out. We would have to have in December any, you know, let's say by December 1st, you would have the numbers of what had been earned previous to that. Mm -hmm. And then you'd have a couple of weeks to process whatever you needed to do to make sure all the numbers were right. This person worked this many hours, gets this credit, this one. Did. And then at the end of the year, at December 31st or before then, you would send out and say, yeah, this person's done this. And that can be credited to the February payment mm -hmm. that's due. Mm -hmm. So everybody kind of follow that the logic that you get the bill and then it's due at some period after that. Mm -hmm. And that's when the crediting would occur. So any any monies earned would have to be probably thirty, about forty five. Maybe let's say sixty days into the system, sixty days before the bill is due, that the monies would be accounted for mm -hmm. through that date. So if the this quarter bill is due, then I do everything from sixty days before that. Any any work within sixty days of that date goes on the next quarter right. and in the next quarter. But, and Joe? Uh, <clears throat> I guess for Jen, I have a question, probably one of many. Uh, the first <laughs> uh -oh. being that you you would do the budgeting for this in at the start of FY22, and then it would be in FY23, whatever that first tax bill, that's when people would get the credit? Well, if i mean it it seems and, like that's the best we could do in terms of a timeline right. i mean you that's... but your budgeting is a it's a one year budget as opposed to a multi year budget correct correct okay but that's why i'm saying like the the actual transaction as far as the city goes is a general ledger transaction and then so it would be a matter of moving it to because even though we we operate on a fiscal year a fiscal calendar can you carry money over from one year to another depending on the type of account that it is and okay. the thing is is right now with real estate taxes they go on calendar year so even though we're on a fiscal year our real estate taxes are on a calendar year and so because of that, we should be able to plug these dates in and make them work. So let, let me let, okay. let's take that for a second. Let's say we got the program up and running by January. Mm -hmm. Everything's all set. Starts in January, finishes. All the work you know, we could pay that anything that would be earned would be. Payable. I'm sorry. But let's let's take it by the bill. The bill is due. You get your bill January first. It's due February first. You're not. There's nothing. There's going to be no credit on that bill for anybody because the program won't have started it, this next next ne next year January. The next bill is 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 due February, January, February, March is due April is sent out April first, due May first. So, anything that would be earned sixty days prior to that, mm -hmm. or more, what's that date then? That would be March first. Mm -hmm. So and anything January. earned in January and February could be credited in the May payment. Do you, do you really want to split 
people's time up like that where you're going to give them a little bit of money whenever they work a few well, hours? I or thought, I thought you were saying that the money's earned. You had said, Tom said the money's earned. Well, that was that question was based around if it's got a, how how we report it as earnings for because, for, because I hear I hear so many communities that we've all spoken with that said, hey, you have to work all your hours or you don't get paid. Yes, I don't yes. I don't know if that's quite and, kosher, but that's right. what they say. And that it's been my experience with people that I've spoken with and, and it also at Westfield that it's the program allows, you know, X amount of months for people to work their hours. And then once that cutoff date is reached, that is when the credits are calculated and the credit all goes on one bill. On one bill. So we one could bill. pay it in the end, the last bill of the year. Right which would be the payment for May 1st. Mm -hmm. So we would have, what if, what if uh, people haven't worked their hours by May 1st? And they either earn nothing, which I don't think is quite legal. I think you have to pay them what they've earned for earned through that date. And that's what they get for a credit. And, and I mean, the expectation would be that, because humor me for one second, if we, if, if budget approval was made July 1st, and so that's the green light to go ahead. We push out applications, get them in. We, you know, assess who goes where. And, and so if people can be placed by October, mm -hmm. that would give them October, November, December, January, February, five months. And I don't think that that's, you know, I think that that's doable. And it would also be a matter of involving the department heads that were interested in having help and saying to them, we have, the work has to be done by February 28th so that we can get it on, we can get all the credits calculated and, and get it on the May, the, the bill due May 1st. And wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be possible to let people work up until the end of that fiscal year and then whatever they've earned, the total amount, put that as a, you know, toward their uh, first, uh, the next fiscal year, the first payment, which would be July? Well, yes, but then we run into a budgeting issue because if this gets approved and it's approved for fiscal 22, then there will be $30,000 in the fiscal 22 budget for the program that would be expected to be paid out via a credit by June 30. So that money couldn't be carried over until the next, until long enough to make the payment the, that, for yourself on the tax? That would be the August payment. I would have to ask, payment. I would have to ask Val because that I don't, uh, it depends on the way that the accounting is going to be done for the program itself. And the reason I'm raising this issue is when I talked to the, the people and I think it was Natick mm -hmm. and, and Framingham, they, they basically said people had to work their hours by the end of the fiscal year. You know, they, if they got it done sooner, then they could pay them conceivably sooner, mm -hmm. but they, they had to work all their time by the end of the fiscal year and the payment came, you know, for the first tax bill of the next fiscal year. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, I guess that that could be done because again, it would just be a matter of if it were, if it were approved in the budget, then they, the people worked their hours by June 30th and it was just, that was the cutoff date and Val was aware that, okay, we're going to, you're going to have to make this adjustment because this is going to have to be moved from overlay to tax revenue right. on this day. Do you know what I mean? Like, I mean, it could be done, but I don't want to get in a position where we're holding up year end closing because we're mm. having trouble calculating something or someone says, Oh, I didn't finish all my hours. I only have three more left. Can I do them in the beginning of July? You know what I mean? So I, to me, that's like, we're kind of cutting it close. Yeah. I I'm, I'm with you on that. And with regard to the people though, 
you know, when they're going to start their job, presumably in October, they're well aware that they have to work their hours by the end, by June 30th. So it's like, that's a hard deadline. It wouldn't be something that that you could normally say, well, yeah, you can work your hours in, in July. I mean, I don't know how you guys function, whether, whether there's a lot of that sort of uh, accommodation going on. I, I think it depends on the on the um, the department head. You know what I mean, and and what the project is, and and I mean, again, if the department heads are aware, look, all their hours have to be done by this day. So so what about kind of going along with what you're saying? What if the deadline was May thirty first? It could be and, May thirty. That would be. It could be May thirty first. You yeah. know that would and then. then now give somebody a month to before the end of the fiscal year to do whatever financial stuff needs to get done. Okay. Somebody has to tally the hours, input them, the assessors have to have time to, calc to to take all of that and put it on each card. I was talking to the assessor today and she was kind of like scratching her head. A the, the, uh, Christine, I was talking about. I assessor. mean, do you but guys are professionals, aren't you? I mean, this should be doable. <laughs> Come on. You think yeah. this is the White House? Or? Right. Um, and according to, um, according to Tom, these people will get W-2s, and they will be put in the system, and it will just be set up so that they don't get any um, state taxes taken out. It'll, it'll just withhold what's supposed to be withheld on the federal level. The federal stuff. Okay. So that's what he said we have to do. Um, he said that, and, and that shouldn't be an issue. Um, like I said, with the payroll system that we have, we, sh we can set them up as their own group, um, you know, and then they'll be segregated from the rest of us so that in pulling reports, we just exclude that group, um, you know, and, and, and I, I mentioned to him, I said, well, you know, what about the whole, they're not supposed to be employees, blah, blah, blah. And he said, there's no other way that you can do it. There, you know, it's it with the state saying one thing and Fed saying another, I mean, you have to report to the Fed. So the right. state, the state understands that that's how we do it. As long as we're not pulling state taxes from right. wages, then we're good. So. Um, I think though that I would, I don't know if you guys want to maybe um, ask Val to come to our next meeting or if you want me to just talk to her, you know, outside of here, but I'd like to get some feedback from her on what her process would be in terms of the timing. Um, because obviously, you know, we, we need to give the assessor enough time to get the information in. We need to, you know, they need to get their, their file to Carol f to get the bills out. Right. But, you know, there's also that piece of the accounting side of it. And I don't want to, I don't, there's two, my two objectives are, I don't want to hold up year end closing. Right. And I don't want to assume that we can cross years if we can't or assume we can't if we can. So right. I'm going to, I'm going to check with her and see, you know, how, how she would handle the accounting entry and what her take is on the timing. What, what, what's Val's position? She's the auditor. She's oh, our she's city auditor. auditor. Mm -hmm. Tom is the we external have auditors. auditor. No, oh, Tom okay. is the external auditor. Yep. So okay. he'll come in and look over the whole system, right. Val, everybody. Val will go on a day-to-day -day basis and say, hey, you can't, you can't do this this way. Or, I'm sure somebody's okay. heard that at some point. <laughs> Anything else from Tom? You know what? I'm going to ask you to, to defer to someone else to chat and i'm gonna look i have a i have a note here somewhere on this makeshift desk of mine and i just want to make sure i think i covered it all but i just want to make sure so yeah okay uh, uh, JP, go ahead uh, do, did peg to, to your knowledge did peg have her meeting with the department heads is there anything oh, you can yes peg had the meeting with the department heads uh and brendan attended and we'd be i think it'd be great to give a short report on on that uh brendan sorry about that <clears throat> yeah uh so 
overall, the presentation went really well. Um, I think uh, department heads uh, seemed very welcoming, and they think that um, you know volunteer placement is something that could, you know, be very helpful and resourceful to you know the departments. Um, the the person that I was wondering about most uh, was actually Val. And Val seemed to think that uh, this would create too much of a disturbance uh, for finance. So, it, you know, I think that's, you know, a huge piece of this because, I mean, a lot of it's going to land on finance, you know, to carry out, you know, some of these tasks. Um, but then, you know, we had some department heads like Chief Alberti who, uh, you know, gave support for the program. Um, you know, even city planning, uh, Jeff Bag had mentioned he thought it could be very useful for uh, projects that they're carrying out in city planning. And so, you know, I think we had almost close to every department present at that meeting. And I think overwhelmingly, um, people seem to be very supportive of the idea. So I consider it a huge plus. I think Peg did a great job, you know, kind of going over what the program is and how it can be utilized with municipal government. And um, it went really well. Cool. I, I then followed up with a few folks, including uh, including Val, and and the chief afterwards, just to kind of see if there was something other other than what was presented at the meeting. And no, I, I think you were quite accurate, Brendan. That in fact they represented, they were happy, and in fact they were happy uh, with 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 the presentation. I know Peg was very pleased with her end of it, so that went very well. So, cool. Uh, any other information to report at this point before we go start to go into trying to design the program? And I and and I'll I'll be happy to fill you in on on the possibilities of CPA and what I've been working on, and my discussion this morning with the mayor about the program. So the uh, we're, we're taking this one piece here with you know, the timeline of when the tax abatement gets applied. And that's what we're focusing on specifically right now, right? We're voting on that. We're voting on kind of a timeline for the whole, for the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and amounts in as much detail as we possibly can. And uh, then focus on, I think, writing it up. And do you have a uh, Peg's draft that we could put up on the sh uh, to share? I do not have that. Did you? Um, I w I, she might have dropped it in Google Docs. Maybe I can. Yeah. Check. Can you? Uh, can you? Yeah. Check that? I'll go in. Hold on. Unless I copied that here. I know one 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 issue. Well, before we get to the issues, let me let me start to fill in a bit about uh, the CPA. That still is a possibility. I reached out to uh, actually a city councilor across the state who was a municipal attorney, and uh, asked him. He had, he had done a lot of work with CPA for the town of Somerville and had uh, recently been elected. I have not heard back from him. He also happens to be in the position of the, on the Municipal Finance Bureau, a lawyer for their staff in his day job. So I, I, when I reached, also reached out to the Finance Bureau, but never heard back from them either. Uh, I, I'm sure they have lots of demands during COVID. But we're still pushing on that. And no one's come up with a reason to say no ever since uh, I spoke with Bob Duran, the guy who wrote the CPA legislation. Uh, and he said that he, I just was really surprised he didn't just say, let's nix this idea because it can't be done. He did say it looked like a stretch. Okay, well, you have to stretch in order to get anywhere, right? Uh, we didn't get to the moon in one step. We had to stretch for it, right? Uh, so this is this, this may be a stretch. I did have a conversation 
on the other hand, with the mayor this morning, and she asked me some very pertinent questions. She asked about the program. She thought we had worked out the details very well. I explained to her exactly what everything that we had, the information that we had all gathered, how the program would work. She had some great questions. Uh, the first question was, can we get it off the ground July 1st? I said, I'm not sure we can start people working for July 1st. Uh, that may be a little ambitious uh, until we have the budget squared away. So she sounded actually very supportive. And, and actually, we talked about the other benefit of the program that you all know of, and that is that the workers who've taken advantage of the program not only got the tax benefit and the city and communities got the benefit of the labor, but there was a community spirit and community involvement that takes place that I think we've reached out to all the uh, many other communities and we felt it, that everybody felt a belongingness, they felt a purpose, and this was really good for our communities on, on a whole different level. So, and, and she said that had been uh, the experience in Northampton as reported by their mayor. And it, it sounded very positive. She also talked about the possibility of another source of funding. And that was the cannabis fund, which I I wouldn't go too far with that one yet until that idea gets a little more fleshed out. But that is another kind of possibility with the thinking that this has an impact on on real estate and values in our community. Uh, and so she thought it might be an appropriate source. Uh, I'll leave that one for 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 her to develop a bit more. Uh, I don't care how it's funded. I just think it needs to be funded, and 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 it make and it makes sense. Uh, and if it can be done with CPA, that's easy. If it can be done with cannabis, that's great. Uh, if it has to be done from the general revenue into the overlay through the overlay account, then I think the the the, the community needs to step up and do just that. So. Those are my thoughts on that subject. I think Jen is still looking for things, but. If we don't have anything else, I, I'm feeling a pressure with generally we, we like to uh, wrap up by seven. It's 640 now. And we could start asking those questions like, what do we think the amount of money should be? That's a simple one. I so uh, just uh, so you guys are aware, I was able to find the draft that oh, good. left in the Google Docs. Can you share the screen? Can I give you permission to share screen? Yeah, you would have to. Uh, yeah, you I, you can. Um, it, yeah, are you the co-host? Uh, oh, oh no, I'm I sorry. Have, I have not created a co-host. If you'd help me on how to do that, I'd be happy to. Uh... Ooh. Uh, um. Or you could take over since you have the document in front of you. How about I just tell you, uh, and again, this is a draft, so um, I will just read you the one section that we were focusing on here. Uh, okay. So um, here it says accounting for abatements. Volunteers may work January 1st, 2021 through November 30th, 2021 for FY22 tax bill deduction. Reductions must be applied to the actual tax bill for the fiscal year shown on the tax bill as an abatement or credit against the amount due. All reductions will be charged against the assessor's overlay account. So that was just a brief line. And I know this is a draft, so I, I you know, I just want to emphasize that I, I think this is, you know, maybe some type of example that she pulled from another community. So yeah, it, it obviously is because we couldn't get yeah, off the ground for January 1st, right. 2021, because we I won't mean, know if it's funded until July 1st, 2021 or June, sometime in June. Right. So, so if we did like, uh, I mean, with that timeline, January 1st, 2022 through November 30th, 2022 for FY 23 tax bill, would that that would be more I, like I think we're I think we're looking at a. If if you were to follow that format, the date you would you would you would fill in would have. So you're saying from working 
the date the date that you said is a the, the operation date yeah it says volunteers may work january 1st 2021 through november 30th i think i think we were saying october 2021 would be the earliest and when i proposed that last week i think everybody still was shuddering yeah. at october 1st I, I so i i think we're really looking at november or december 1st 2021 Uh, do, you, do you recall are they, are everyone shuddering last week? <laughs> well, the, I think uh, I, I can't speak for others, but I shuddered because I think we were giving people two months to work their hours. Uh, I don't see if we were going to start for FY22, I don't see why we couldn't, you know, you could start depending on what positions are available. Why couldn't people start working, say, September 1st? and give them seven or eight months to work their hours. I, I think the difficulty becomes, uh, and, and I had this conversation with the mayor this morning and I pitched to her that it really would be not, cause she was stuttering about operations and human resources and training. I said, well, listen, how about if we did like one or two trainings a year that you got everybody together and she said, that sounds like a wonderful idea. And that would really minimize the impact. So we kind of be looking to have everybody be ready to go at that date. So if you think we could have the applicant, let me go over what. I mean, is there a need for people to, to be all on the same timetable here? There's a need for training to be on the same timetable. But I mean, training in most other communities is done in the workplace. I'm, I'm, I'm saying operational training on open meeting law, on Corey testing, uh, or not Corey test, Corey checking, on all of the administrative stuff that, that, that would be involved with human resources, all the sign up paperwork. That can be done all on the same time that would simplify this whole process and make it easy. But I don't, I didn't see that when I got on board, I didn't see that as being particularly onerous or, or time consuming. Were you I mean, if we're asking people to be a clerk, to, to stand at a copy machine, how much training in do they really need? There's no, I'm not talking about on the job training. Jen, can you help me out? <laughs> With 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 uh, what I'm trying to convey. Yeah. Um. Well, I, I'm. It's not I'm, on the job training. What we're talking about is training for whom? Not. It's not let, 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 maybe I used the wrong term. Operational paperwork, administrative work to get the ball rolling for people to start in the departments right because we need to there's the application would have to come in that would require the you know the review process and then we had talked a little bit about you know if brendan would go through and kind of um you know uh, and pull out the ones that seem to have the necessary skills that we're looking for and then it would be a matter of involving the department head i mean it's it's a like to your point about you know how hard is it to stand at a copier it's like not not every department is going to need someone with doing that so that said like when i was in westfield we were the audit department and we had a woman who came in and she did our filing, but she was filing accounts payable records. And that was, it was way different than here, file these alphabetically. Do you know what I mean? So there's a, a process where you want to, the departments have to get someone in who will be able to grasp what it is they need done, especially we had mentioned too, like special projects. I mean, obviously we're not going to be giving people extremely difficult things, but you want to make sure you're going to have someone in there who at least understands, you know, the department in some way, shape or form. I mean, if you've never been in finance to come in and then start, you know, separating out invoices for certain things, you're not going to know what you're looking at. I mean, so, you know, how, how long, what period of training would you think is necessary for somebody to learn that? 
Well, I don't think I, I think what JP was saying was it was it's not so much training the per, the the senior. It's the beef it's the work beforehand to make sure that we're placing the right people in the right position sure. and that those people you know that we have vetted i mean we're, we're going to have an eligibility in terms of in, uh, eligibility requirement in terms of income that has to be verified sure. you know there's there's it's the the um i guess for for lack of a better term it's the onboarding process that is going to be time consuming because it's essentially like hiring someone you know i mean it's the same as if you're if you're giving a job to someone um i mean when i we didn't mention it last week but you know in, in previous weeks i sort of pitched this as you know why don't we view this as a pilot test and so if we're only dealing with a half a dozen, let's say six to eight individuals, you know, it's sort of like, it's a smaller number. So we're not going to have, somebody wouldn't have to donate, uh, devote a lot of time into getting people up to speed, but you know, it'd be part of the learning process. I mean, other than try to come up with a fine tuned finished product that, that we're going to apply to 20 people. But, or have I missed something? No, but I think you're actually, it's actually the process of dwindling it down to 20 people in and of itself is going to be, could be a process. If we get, we have no idea how many applications we're going to get. So if we get 70 and we're only with the pilot program, we're doing, you know, 15 mm -hmm. or 20 positions, right? Yeah. Then we have to go through those and we have to check and make sure that they're financially eligible. And then we, that might weed some people out if they don't, if they don't hit the um, eligibility requirement there, right. then it will be go back through the ones that are left and say, okay, we only have these 15 positions and they're in these 15 <clears throat> departments or whatever. And so then it's a matter of matching up the applications and then it's also a matter of okay well what if you what if you call someone and you say okay you know can you come in for an interview blah 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 and then they say you know i decided i don't want to do it or they're having help uh, I mean, you know what i mean so there's what a you're talking about is, is basic hr stuff in terms of bringing people in and having worked in an hr shop for a couple of years this i'm it's not it's time consuming well it can be time consuming but, you know, in terms of looking at 70 applications, you know, you could easily say, you know, we are accepting applications for this and, and the first 15 or the first 20 applications will be accepted. So, you know, the thing is you don't put yourself in the position of having, having to, to go through 70 different applications. I mean, if you keep the program small, especially in the first year, you know, because you're just trying to get the concept, mm -hmm. you know, and get get it up and running, you know, but you can expand it at some later point. But initially, keep the thing, keep the program relatively small, maybe even a dozen people. Mm -hmm. And, and, but don't, don't, you know, try to go for pro, uh, Broadway, you know, on the first no. program. Well, right. I don't, but, I don't think we are doing that. And, and, and I mean, let's. Well, yeah, but there's a tendency for, for people to say, well, what about this? And we're going to have all this other stuff. And, and let's keep it simple. I mean, this isn't rocket science. Right. But I guess we also have to just look at the terms of, it, look at it in terms of timeline. I mean, when, once we, once we make an application available, is it as soon as we get 15 applications, we're going to shut the application process down? Or is it you have 30 days to apply? Like, these are the things that are going to determine what the timeline has to be. Okay. You know, so, I mean. I mean, the, 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 a pilot program is, is supposed to be, well, you, generally they're smaller. It's more of a proof of concept. So, you know, accept the first 20 applications and take it from there or take, go through as many applications as you need to fill 15 or 20 jobs. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are ways to, to so do it. One way, one way of doing it is taking it until you'd have a certain number of applications or another way to do it is to say, we start with applications on this date 
and they must be in by that that day. Sure. Uh, could it, could it, you so know, I think that's the first. The, the, if we could make that decision or attempt to make it now, then that would lead to the rest of the timelines. So it, it, I'm more comfortable, I think, with started July 1st, uh, have the applications ready, have the process ready, have the job description sent out to the to the various departments, take your applications. Uh, they have to be in by a certain date. Would that date be July 15, two weeks? Would it be July 30th? I think a month. I, 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 would, I was going to say a month. Was everybody comfortable if we started with applications July 1st that they be turned in by August 1st or July 31st? Give, give people a month to submit. Right. Well, and also, sure. and to become aware of the program. I mean, it, you know what I mean? Like, I guess, um, what am I trying to say? It's not like, like we're not going to send a blank application to every senior that's on our tax roll. So people, Correct. we need to be able to put it out there. And you know what I mean? Just because we release the application on July 1st doesn't necessarily mean that everyone's going to know about it and, and jump on it on July 1st. Right. So. Is there a reason we wouldn't send it to everybody who already qualifies for one of those overlays? Uh, sure. Because if you send something to, to the world, you know, a lot of people are going to send stuff back that may or may not be well thought out. I, th I think that's a good, th that's a reasonable point. I, I think you, not everybody who's one of the people who are currently getting overlay funds are ready to do this program, are motivated. I want people to start thinking about this as we talk about it and say, yeah, I, I, I want to volunteer for the city. I want to be part of this. And, and, and then maybe not an application, but at least a, a notification of the, of the, that the programs out there, we have to get the, that, that information out. And yeah. so that becomes a whole, maybe that's, that, that's next, uh, next quarter's uh, project is to how, how to promote this, but we have to first get it in the budget before. <laughs> right. and, and, and that may be, maybe we're not off the ground really until, until, until the budget's accepted in, in, in June. June so yeah. Maybe, maybe you need, maybe, maybe we should be reserving a month or two just to get the word out there mm. officially. I mean, that can happen while other things are going on too. And that can happen um, pretty quickly as well. When after July first, did you say? And I'm I, I apologize. I don't know this, but I'm not the collector, and I don't live in East Hampton. So after July first, is it August fifth that the next bill is due? Or I'm sorry, August first that the next tax bill is due, the or next is it tax bill tax oh, bill is due on August August first? So yeah, and you'd have to have money earned. 60 days prior to that to begin to put it yeah, in. That's, that's, so that, that that's way be. too soon. Yeah. No, 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 no. And, and where I was going with that, it had nothing to do with the hours. I was just thinking being able to have some sort of an insert in that bill announcing the program. Mm. But depending on when the bills go out, obviously we need the money approved before we can say, hey, we have this program going on. You know right. what I mean? Have, have we even discussed the issue of how much money what? I mean, we've talked to cities and towns, and they've given us a lot of dollar amounts, but what's right for East Stampton? Right. So that becomes another question once we establish the timeline. I mean, I, I'd like to stay focused on the timeline for the timeline. Okay. Timeline for the moment till we could nail that down and then talk about the money. If Speaking you... of timeline, I think we're bumping up against. We're bumping up against seven o'clock. So I guess we have to make a decision whether we continue or meet again next week. Anybody up for continuing? Let's say for another uh, thirty minutes. I that's fine or with me. Okay with it. Everybody's okay with that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the the notes will be sparse, but thirty <laughs> thirty minutes. Yeah, just. We can do that. Okay. So do we need, if we don't know the program's up and running until June, mid-June, budget approved, do we need time to promote? 
because I don't think you can readily promote prior to that date. Mm-mm. Brendan, I see you're ready to say something, but the, your, your mic was on mute. Yeah, sorry. Uh, that would be a crazy uh, you know, time period to try to get the word out, you know, to have that short of a period. Is that what, is that what I'm understanding, a month? Well, I, 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 how much time do you think you need to we we need to make sure that we can get twelve good applicants? Maybe so to get twelve, maybe you need twenty two good applicants uh, at a minimum. I mean, maybe I, I, I'm no marketing expert or uh, one for publicity. I mean, you know, we constantly try to get information out there, but. Um, if that was the case, if you were dealing with about a month or shy of that, I would really suggest that we talk to Stan Diamond and Jen Ramsey and the folks over at East Hampton Media to put out a PSA and get that ready, um, you know, maybe in uh, May uh, of sorts, and then, you know, have it ready on the back burner for when, you know, we have to launch the publicity in June. But I, I would definitely start thinking about different types of media because um, Facebook's fine and, and the word can spread there, but then you know we also want to be able to get the word out on our public access for sure. Uh, we just have a lot of people who turn to the public access, you know, who don't obviously have Facebook. Um, so we need to think about all the different areas that we want to spread this out to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we can have that that done and ready uh, before June, middle of June. You know, we're gonna have everything to hit send. And I mean, I I think it's it's perfectly feasible. If it, JP, you're saying the middle of June, it budget usually gets approved. Budget gets approved anywhere from the first week in June to the last week in June, typically. Okay. Uh, now, if the legislature doesn't do their thing and they're up in the air about revenues for some reason, that we would be sitting there saying we have to go on a one twelfth budget for what happened on what was accepted in the previous fiscal year, and now everything's on hold. Mm. Okay. I'm not borrowing trouble. I'm just being realistic. Yeah. So is there a 95%, 90 to 95% chance? Yes, it will be sometime in June. Okay. So if we got everything prepped up like a month in advance and, you know. Maybe you do a everything blitz. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, my concern is that it, we drop this last second and then we have one person apply because we failed to get <laughs> information. You know what I mean? Because then that looks horrible too. So I think we have to be thoughtful about that. <clears throat> So maybe you extend the application period through sometime in August? So so applications uh, July 15th to August uh, 13th. And that gives us a solid two weeks to get the... the, uh, uh, program you know out there and then it gives a full month for it to continue to get out there and um get the applications in and and sorted Mm -hmm. okay and i think that as long as we're like like brendan was saying and you know as long as we're planning for it and kind of have everything you know tied up in a neat ribbon and all we have to do is hit go once we get the approval then i think that that's doable all right and then we look at uh, applications forward to the senior service director by that date all right good how long would you need to be able to sort through the applications qualify the people brendan and how long do you think the finance folks will would need to do their finance qualifications once the applications come in well one question that i have in regards to that is are we going to require that every applicant send in their income verification with their application or are we going to weed out what we weed out the uh the well i guess we can't do that because we need to know if they're financially eligible so do, do we we don't have to put financial constraints on it 
Uh, if we want to, that's one thing, but it's not required in the program. Mm. I think if we use CPA funds, we definitely want to have financial constraints. Right. If we right. don't use super CPA funds, I think we're open to not put financial constraints. Mm. Uh, I think there's definite merit to saying we're directing uh, certain slots to folks who are, are, are the neediest in the community. Uh, what do you think, folks? As far as uh, interviewing potential candidates, uh, that should be pretty easy work. I mean, on my end, and I'm assuming personnel is going to be involved because we'll probably have to do some really quick, you know, things with conflict of interest, I would assume, mm -hmm. right? And uh, some other basic trainings. But I mean, that's a pretty quick process. There's not much to that. And I feel like even to fill my activity coordinator position a year ago, uh, we went through you know, several interviews within a two week period of time. Um, so I, I can't imagine, you know, with the help of Emily, I'm sure we could pull right through that. So that part I'm not concerned about. But remember, you're the one who's doing that initial look at the applications. You're the one who's then matching with the job descriptions that are already back in, mm -hmm. trying to make that match, and then setting up the interviews with the other with the other folks. Is two mm -hmm. weeks aggressive, or is four weeks more reasonable? Well, I mean, I guess it depends on how many positions there are, of course. Let's uh, say so if we had nothing. like five positions and like say twenty applicants yeah we probably would want to extend it beyond two weeks i mean i don't know i'm sure for emily's you know schedule and my own we would have to coordinate that uh but i i think if we're talking about you know one or two positions to start off with that wouldn't take more than a couple of weeks i can't imagine i i thought we were running a program somewhere between somewhere like eight to twelve people for the whole program they don't, wouldn't all have to start you know at at the, but it'd be good to get them all on board through the through that HR uh, paperwork stuff all at the same time. Uh, Twelve people probably going to look at twenty two applications is my guess. Well, I mean, four, four it, personnel uh, and, and you know, the COA and personnel have gone through several you know uh, interviews in one day. I mean. If it would be beneficial to the program to have it done in, in a two week period, um, you know, I, I would rather lean on that if it was going to be more beneficial to the program rather than, you know. Don't forget vacations, vacations during the summer. We're doing this during the summer and we also have, geez, I'm on vacation the last week of August. I don't know. Well, let me let me talk to Emily and just see what she has to think about this, because I, I don't want to speak on, you know, for her, um, but if I could at least touch base with her and just see, you know, All right. so you're I'm launching at... a program with eight or 12 positions, potentially with almost 20 candidates, if it would be realistic for her in a two week time period, you know, to do that. So I'll follow well, up with her on that. You're gonna follow up and I'm gonna pencil in August 30, August 31st. Okay. All right. Uh, and now, so that means interviewed by you and by the departments by that day. Okay. Back with recommendations. How much time do you need to then coordinate to get people called up and assigned and say, hey, we'd love to have you start? Okay, that could probably be done in, in a week. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I would say that once the interview process is complete, um, you know, then it's just a matter of the department head you know, giving their blessing or not. And I'd say you could notify people within a week. I do agree though, JP, actually you had a good point about vacations because, um, I'm sorry, my house is loud tonight. Um, we had, you had a good point about vacations because I was forgetting that the, it'll be each department head that's going to be having a position for this. So, you know, not to say that, you know, we're all out of the building at the same time, but I would say that, you know, if we think it could be done in two weeks, we should give it three because of the time of it. But that's just my thought because there, you know, there are going to be a lot of it. It's a, it's a lot right now to coordinate meetings with leadership. 
that everyone can attend is what I'm trying to say. And we're all working from home. So, you know, having to do that around vacations and when people are hopefully. So in let's, the building. Move, let's move from August 31st to September 7 for decisions from the departments to Brendan to then call up and say, hey, let's go ahead and, and, and do this. Mm -hmm. uh, so, fun fact, uh, the 31st is a Tuesday. The 6th is Memorial Day. And you guys don't work Fridays. So that gives them two extra days. I work Fridays. <laughs> Oh, okay. All right, good. <laughs> good. So September, what was that? Friday, September 7, we were saying? All right. Uh, and let's not forget, too, that like because this is a pilot, we can definitely adjust these timelines. All of the dates can be adjusted. Right. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm going through this exercise to get the dates and picks, and then to say where did where where we we actually start somebody. Right. Uh, because what has to be done between the decision and the start is the HR stuff, and mm -hmm. I'm thinking that's going to be at least another another not another week. I mean, I would say as long as as Emily has. You know, we talked about her putting together like a packet that has any, um, you know, um, privacy policies that need to be signed or code of ethics or whatever. So if that's if we have those already made up, then, you know, to give them out to people and then say, please get these back to us within the week. You know, I mean, that I think is sounds, doable so for sure. We're at the 14th. We could actually start people then September 21st. Yeah. yeah. For a I mean, start date? Oh, wow. That's falling in with the time frame. That I, <laughs> I think uh -huh. I suggested here. All right. So uh, I'm looking. I, I, I had recommended October 4th. And then that could run technically through, we were saying May, perhaps. I'm saying early May after the conversation I had with the assessor. So I'm thinking wow. it would be really good to have the, all of that wrapped up by, let's call it April 30th, from September 20, 21st to April 30th. And then the system has a couple of 60 days to kind of filter out all that has to be processed for payroll. Mm -hmm. And then accounting, because one person has to tell another how much money, and then it has to go to, to, to various billing systems. Right. And could then be credited on everything gets credited on the same bill is my my guess, yes. and that would be for which bill? If if the work is completed by April thirtieth, and everything gets processed by May first, it's not going to be. It's going to be the July bill for August, which we'll see, and that becomes the question to ask, ask uh, the assessor and the collector and Val. Can we have all the work wrapped up in the system and then credited for the tax uh, payment in August, for by August 1st? Set. I see a nod in your head, Jen, but no voice because the, the mic's off. I'm trying to spare you the background <laughs> noise right now. Background That's noise. why I was just nodding. <laughs> so I, I think I think we're doing we're doing good on that in terms of of how the process will lay out practically. Uh, yep. Any questions about that or thoughts about that part of it? Good. We have some dates. How about amounts of money, and then we'll get to numbers of people. Uh, it just comes to me as simple that we do either a thousand or fifteen hundred, uh, and I'm leaning, I think, toward the fifteen hundred to say, okay, let's see how the maximum works out. Uh, thoughts about how much we offer? The fifteen hundred would actually, after the expenses, be more like thirteen fifty or fourteen hundred dollars off the tax bill. Mm -hmm. because there would be the taxes and the other uh, the social security right yeah, I mean, God, Jay. so we can see the 1500 wow um 
And then in terms of the number of participants, I suppose it could always be flexible. We, we should pitch a number that says this is what we foresee in the pilot program, X number of people at $1,500 a piece. Uh, when I threw out the figure of 30 to the mayor, she was not taken aback by that number. Uh, Again, I would, to, I would love to see that number on the table in the program, but I'm not sure that really becomes what we're envisioning as a pilot program. Right. I think there's money left over. Joe? Yeah. Uh, maybe five years down the road, 30 might be a good number. But I think if you're, if the more people you bring on, the more administrative work, you know, these people here on the screen are going to have to deal with, especially Brendan. No, uh, I'm a, I'm I, let's <laughs> and you too. No, so the no, first you're have to do it. <laughs> the first year, let's let's keep it at about a dozen. I I I, I can I can live with that uh, as 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 a goal for the first year. Mm -hmm. Brendan, yeah, I I think if we're especially talking about a pilot program, yeah. you know that way. You know, versus taking on, you know, 20 or 30 applicants in a pilot program where we have no idea what that looks like. And I think 1500 is enough incentive to bring in some probably some pretty strong candidates. Yeah. And, um, you know, the 8 to 12 zone is, is probably just where we want to start off. So we don't bite off more than we can chew. So yeah. if we looked and asked for uh, a dozen people, at fifteen hundred dollars a piece, that runs to a, an expenditure 18. of eighteen thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Yeah, that I would say that possibly, you know, I mean, maybe put that out there, and then if if we have to knock it back to ten people and fifteen thousand dollars, but we can still get it approved, then sure, that, you know, at least we have some make, wiggle room. That would well, make we sense. Had talked last go around about the pilot needing to be a multi-year pilot, right? Because. Mm -hmm. Uh, just just for logistics. Mm -hmm. How do we operationalize that? No, you can do it two consecutive years and consider them both to be pilot pilot years. Yeah, but I, but I think if our proposal is a three year pilot, uh, year one maximum of fifteen, year two maximum of twenty, year three maximum of thirty. Uh, that way we get a real feel for, for the impact of the expanding uh, program. So what I hear you saying, and I'm liking this very much, Jay, is, is we, we were set a dozen people at 1500 for the first year. That gets to $18,000. In the second year, we'd have uh, a certain number of people. Yep. Brendan, you're laughing there. I There's a wrong. weird noise going on in the background, and I just can't. Yeah. Sorry. That's not mine. That's not mine. <laughs> it may be me. Uh, it, it, I don't. I don't know. I apologize. <laughs> oh, and, if, and if it's not, let me. Uh, it, it sounds like me. knocking. Yeah. Hmm. Like a, a fax machine or something. Let's let's look at. Is it is it there now? No. Okay. Good. Uh, so let's look at uh, what would you recommend for the second year if the first year was 12 people, 1,500 and 18,000? Why, why don't we play that by year? The reason I'm saying to push it is it could come out is here's our recommendation, folks. This is how we envision the pilot. It's a three-year pilot, first year, second year, third year projections. Well, sometime, way, sometimes, it, that's giving people, people a, sometimes giving people a number it becomes set in stone and the expectations are then there to be met. I mean, we may start the first year with 12 and maybe go down to eight for the second year, depending on how many people apply. So I think we're spending a lot of time trying to determine numbers that will be quickly overtaken by time. And that may very well be the case. My concern is how do we make sure that everybody sees this as a pilot? Mm. Because yeah. you put the words pilot, pilot test. multi three year pilot. Here's the first year. Three year mm. pilot, sure. Three year pilot. Here's the first year. I mean, and the second and third years can flow from what happens in the first year. Right. 
I agree. It has to be flexible. I just didn't want folks saying, hey, it doesn't seem to be working so well the first year for some reason. Yeah. And then they but start. It may not. And, and it may be honest. Well not. Because yeah. certainly, I, I think the expectation is a certain number of people just don't work out. Oftentimes, you have to have, I don't know, in HR experience, do you, do you have to go through three people to get one good one? Do you go through two to get one good? Depends on what you're trying to recruit for. Right. Sure. And we don't know at this point the nature of any of the jobs that the department heads are going to put forward. So, so we'll find out. We'll find out, yeah. All right. So we have the first year pretty well defined. What about the... Uh, was there anything else in that letter, Brendan, that you were reading from that we have missed? Uh, uh, any, like, in regards to, let me just see here. Any other pieces of information that we haven't kind of dealt with? Um, well, let me get to the top page here. Uh, okay. Um, well, this kind of taps into a little bit what we were talking about. There's a section in here how to um, for volunteer how to apply for volunteer opportunities. Do you want me to dive into that? If if there's decisions to be made, I, I think that's appropriate. Okay. All right. Uh, so um, all of this is being channeled through uh, personnel. Application forms are available at personnel and the COA or by download from the city website. Uh, at easthamptonma.gov. All applicants received before June 30th will be reviewed for eligibility. Applications received after July 1st, 2021 will be reviewed for eligibility dependent on remaining volunteer opportunities. I think we've we've worked out the dates for applications, so that's good. All right. Okay. Um, let's see here. We're up on 10 minutes to get to 7.30. All right. Uh, so I'll read off the, the different things that have been, that are, that are highlighted. Um, there's the volunteer period mentioned. Um, the next section is income limitations. Um, income limitations, arguments for and against. So let's take that one up then. Okay. I'm thinking about eligibility income, I think we're talking about, Joe. Yeah. Joe, you're laughing. This is good. Well, I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if we take the wealthiest people and give them these jobs, how is that going to show up in the paper? Uh, well, so the, here, here's a, you know what is written in the draft, and you guys can get a feel for it. Uh, for married couples, it's sixty thousand. For single, forty thousand. That sounds think, reasonable. Yeah. I, I do think that we should have um, income limitations. And I, I only say that because, you know, getting a feel for the residents after the tax rate went up this past year, um, you know, I think that it's going to, I think that it, it looks better that we're trying to help the people that, that, that struggle. Mm -hmm versus you know a free-for-all um you know because then then you're going to run into well okay i'm not a senior but since you have no income re requirements how come i can't do it you know what i mean like i think that it's i think it makes sense to have income requirements um you know specifically for the program then the program the income requirements typically run uh low and moderate if, if you're eligible for low and moderate income senior housing then you'd be eligible for this program if though if the seat we were using cpa money that mm -hmm. would be the standard that yeah. amount is set up usually in april so in april next year we'll know what the figure will be for that year mm -hmm. right now it's it's there's a figure for one you know one person household of two or three all the way up to eight and i think the range is pretty much from fifty four thousand for one up to about a uh, hundred thousand if you had eight family members uh living in your in your household 
and that includes the income of all the people mm -hmm. in the household. Mm -hmm. So if you had eight little ones running around, <laughs> you, you could you could be making a hundred grand and, and be paying a lot to support them. So I, I guess I guess I would I would either stay with that figure or raise it slightly from there. It makes it pretty easy sense to stay with that figure. Uh, I think as a starting point. Yeah, Joe. Yeah, yeah. I, I concur. Yeah. All right, so. CPA, low and moderate income eligibility, whether we use CPA funds or not. Moderate income. Okay, Brendan, you're on. You have seven minutes. All right. So uh, the next section is dealing with um, ownership taxpayers must be assessed owner of the property in which the tax to be abated is assessed or have acquired ownership before the work is performed and the abatement is applied. If the property is subject to a trust, the senior must have legal title, i.e. be one of the trustees on the applicable January 1st assessment date or at the time the work is performed. I think all of that comes from the 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 Joe shaking his head. I'm, I thought it all came from like the the regulations. You think that was imposed by someone for their community? Uh, possibly. Uh, let me just here. I think many of the other towns and cities were pretty straightforward in saying that you know you had to be the owner of the property. <laughs> and when when I see the word trustee. I think how would that look in the Daily Hampshire Gazette to say that we're providing help for trustees? I mean, this ain't a bankruptcy court, is it? Or <laughs> I mean, it, generally just... those who, those those who manage to get the properties into trusts have pretty sophisticated lawyers to Absolutely. be able to, to to get that that worked out. Uh, so. That that word is poison. <laughs> yeah, I think it makes it, I think it makes sense to to limit it to it must be the owner of the property. I mean, yep, you know. But that's going to preclude anyone volunteering for someone else, right? Not I, necessarily. We well, have necessarily. the option of having them be part of the process or not. That's a, another question whether we would allow someone to substitute. Well, but that that line right there kind of disallows it. Unless they, there's- Dave, hey, this is a pilot test. Yeah. It's a pilot. We don't have to put everything on here for the first year. For the first year, you don't. Right. So arguments for or arguments against having a substitute person? We have one minute to discuss. <laughs> I, I think it's going to be really important. I, I, I think some of the, the most needy homeowners are the ones that are going to need someone to, to do the work in their stead. I think that that really changes the nature of the program, though. If we start focusing on substitutes, I mean, I think if it's a relative of an elderly homeowner, I think that would fly fairly easily. But if they're not a relative, then I think we're stepping, we're, we're getting a little bit outside the bounds here. I, I think if we look right to the, to the law itself, the way I remember it, the law provides that anyone may substitute for the homeowner if the homeowner is unable to perform the function, unable through disability to be able to perform the function or inability. So I think we meet the requirements of the law in that regard. Uh, and I don't think it has to be, it could be the, the, the neighbor who lives next door to you who says, geez, I'd love to help you out. And I know you're struggling. What, what happens when that neighbor doesn't work the full number of hours? Then the person doesn't get the credit, the full credit. Just like you think an elderly homeowner work. and a neighbor who didn't work the full hours, they're going to be able to resolve that? That's to me, I, I see that as their, as their issue that doesn't involve us except to say you can have 
someone work for you if that person meets the Corey test, if they know how to do the job, if they get successfully uh, uh, accepted by the department head, yes, they can serve uh, serve the volunteer work. At, at some point down the road, you know, I I think it would be fine to look to look at this, but and for the first year, I think this is you know, let's get the concept, the basic concept down, and if if the if the proxies are people, relatives of the homeowner, then I think that's an easier sell than somebody who isn't a relative who, that where, where there is no relationship. I hear you. Is there any other uh, uh, one who'd like to speak to the point? And then I'd be happy to entertain a motion. Uh, really quick question. Is there anywhere um, ADA guidelines on this? I mean, because I think that's one of those things that you have to always be cautious about. It's like when we do transportation, we have to be you know, very mindful of ADA requirements. And if we step outside of those boundaries, then you know, that could create problems too. So I don't know if there is. I'm not saying there is, but I'm just wondering if anybody knows. Well, someone could say, hey, the law allows for the uh, accommodation and you're not providing the accommodation in this program, and therefore I am not able to uh, gain the benefit. So someone probably could challenge what we decide and take it, you know, to court. Gosh, help, I hope nobody help, ever. Help me understand if if somebody was blind, you know, then then how do you handle that? Well, I'm assuming that someone someone is 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 not blind. Well, let's say somebody is blind. The allow a law allows for someone who is sighted to be able to do the work for them, and you're not allowing me to take advantage of the program because I, mean, what's, I have a sighted person who can do the work, and well, you won't let what's me. some of the benefit of the program. I mean, like you said earlier, JP, one of the benefits of the program is you get a stronger bond between the individual participant and the town. Yes, you do. And if, if you're not doing the work, then where is that bond going to get formed? Or will it be formed? That will be part of, yeah, that, that, I, I agree. Jen, I, I think we've overlotted our time on this one, and we may punt it, or Jen? Uh, I just want to add real quick, I mean, I think that given all the discussion surrounding this, maybe it makes the most sense for the pi for the first pilot year to make it so that it has to be the homeowner who's working the hours. And the reason behind that is to assess the level of interest and also to determine, you know, as we go through this, people tend to talk. So I'm sure that if there are people out there who are like, hey, I, you know, I would have loved to do this, but physically I can't, but my daughter would do it for me. Like maybe we can kind of gain some perspective on if adding that in, in subsequent years makes sense. But I think if we keep it, like, I think if we keep it for the first year, just the homeowner, you know, has to be the one doing the work, then at least we can see what the true interest of the seniors is. You swayed me. The only question is, Brendan, I think we ought to run this by uh, someone in, 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 in HR in terms of the ADA question. Mm. Is that something okay. we can ask? Yeah, I, I think it would be wise before we decide to vote on that, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. to check in, because I, I really wouldn't want to fall into this position where all of a sudden the committee is getting slammed for not allowing people with disabilities to participate in this program. I, I just, I don't know. Well, the city hall is, I mean, all of our buildings are ADA, ADA accessible, correct? Like they're all up to code, they have to be. So that said, I mean, I guess, I mean, the, the, the limitations of the actual position could pose a problem depending on what the, the department heads want them to do. But I mean, you know, if, if you want someone to come in and, and sort things or whatever, then that, that kind of won't matter, you know, if they're, if they, I think we're, I know, I think we're, we gotta, we gotta roll on this. We're, 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 in our, we're into the weeds here. Is it, My family's going to disown me. That, that we think we need to, to wrap up. Uh, I don't see any hands. 
Uh, the next question would be meeting. I think we have a chance to meet on November 19th in seven days or in three weeks. 19th puts us next week. Uh, three weeks puts us to December 3rd. I think if, if people can swing it, I would say next week. Absolutely. But just make sure we keep it at an hour, though. <laughs> Sorry about that. The pressure was on to come up with some decisions. So uh, I, I, I'm good with next week, 6 o'clock. Brendan? Yeah, that's good by me. Uh, Joe, if, if I could uh, take a look at your notes and maybe we can connect with Peg about starting to implement some of these things from today's meeting into the draft. I don't want to start messing around with the draft because I know that Peg kind of put in Google Docs. I'm sure she probably doesn't mind, but I don't want to assume. So we should. Sure. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. I, if you're looking for a motion, I'm looking for anyone else that has any further comment. If not, I will accept a motion. I move that we adjourn this meeting. Second. A second. Yes. <laughs> All, uh, aye, 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 roll call aye. vote, Jay. Aye. 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 Yeah. Right. <laughs> We're good to go. Thank you so much, folks. Have a good night. Right, have a good night, everybody. Good job. Thanks, folks. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye.